Velina. So in keeping with the theme of the festival, the healing power of storytelling, we offer the story of Hawaii, which is Pele in Hi'iaka, um, pictured behind me. Uh, so we have two different chants. Uh, we have an opening chant and a closing chant that we would like to offer. And um, this is Mele no Pele. Ele oi ke ala mau kau kau, ele oi ke malgai o buna o gama e ma ela o kapuale. Ela kapi na iku kalaule, o o puka kula kapule na. Hey, na kia kua inohoi. Ka uma kana lau kale o kale o valinu. Ka uma kana ya o kale o kale o valinu. In acknowledgement of this uh, digital volcano overflowing with wonderful films over the last month or so, uh, mahalo for having us. Wow. Thank you both. So it's my honor to welcome everyone to the sixth annual Mother Tongue Film Festival. Thank you for joining us. My name is Joshua Bell. I'm curator of globalization at the National Museum of Natural History and co-director of the Mother Tongue Film Festival. Um, before I say more, I want to acknowledge with respect the Piscataway people on whose traditional territory the Smithsonian and indeed my own home stand and whose relationship with the land west of the Chesapeake Bay continues to this day. Founded in 2016, the Mother Tongue Film Festival opens on the United Nations International Mother Languages Day, which happens annually on February 21st. The festival is an effort of recovering voices, which is a Smithsonian initiative evolving the National Museum of Natural History, the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, and the National Museum of American Indian and the Asian Pacific American Center. We're grateful to our Smithsonian and non-Smithsonian partners for their support and extend our thanks to our various sponsors. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Island to Island Q&A. This program is presented as part of the 2021 Mother Tongue Film Festival, the Healing Power of Storytelling. And this year, the festival takes place entirely online and as always highlights the confluence of cinematic and mother languages. Today, we invite to the conversation um, with director Jacqueline Hazen, as well as Chris Cato and Keone Franco, whose stories are told in the island to island an official selection of this year's Mother Tongue Film Festival. If you're new to the festival, I encourage you to check out mothertongue.si.edu to learn about the featured films and the upcoming events. Your feedback is always welcome to the festival's various social media challenge. Uh, they're already on screen, but I'd like to welcome our guests, guests director Jacqueline Hazen, who's joining us from Washington, DC, Chris Cato, who's joining us from New York, uh, Brooklyn, and Keone DeFranco, who's joining us from Los Angeles. Welcome you all. Um, thank, you. thank you for that wonderful chant to begin that it's um, wonderful to hear. Um, so really, I wanted to start by asking you a uh, first question, which um, is my understanding is that Island to Island emerged out of Jacqueline's film project as part of her graduate work at NYU. So having said that, I was wondering if you all could kind of reflect on the making of the film and how Island to Island came about. Do you want me to go first, guys? Go ahead. Okay. So um, as part of my PhD in anthropology at NYU, um, I had a unique opportunity to study not just films, uh, including indigenous filmmaking movements in the Americas, Oceania, and the Arctic, um, but also to study documentary film production. Um, so it was a chance to put into practice when you're studying, um, say, anthropologist filmmakers who work to make films where they didn't hold all the power. 
Uh, it's called the Program in Culture and Media. It was founded by one of my advisors and includes many wonderful filmmakers and teachers. Um, and importantly, all the camera equipment and editing software that you need. So when it came time for my year long workshop class set in Inway, uh, New York City, um, I ran into another PhD student who is Hawaiian, Hile Hobart, who studied the dynamics of Hawaiian and colonial histories of food. And uh, I was explaining to her that I had this opportunity to make a film, which is very, very different from writing about something. Um, when you make a film, you can showcase the sound, uh, performances, the voices and the stories of people. Um, I've been singing with choirs most of my life. And so that idea of sort of sound coming from human bodies and resonating is important to me. Um, and my friend, Hiile, mentioned uh, that she had friends in New York City who were learning Hawaiian chant and uh, they were about to have a recital. And uh, I asked if we could be introduced. Yes. And I should uh, acknowledge that um, this wouldn't have been possible without the generosity of uh, our Kumu Oli, Ke Kumu Antipua Kanako Ole Kanahele. Um, Dr. Kanahele um, is uh, one of the uh, leaders of the Edith Kanako Ole Foundation, uh, named after her mother. And so um, our chant recital uh, came about, but um, there were other chant recitals before us. So um, they were titled uh, Pagan Pride. So our recital was Pagan Pride 3. And uh, there were other iterations. Um, I'm just looking at my notes. In 2010, there was a Pagan Pride 2 on Oahu the island of Oahu. And then in 2005, there was um, a showcase of chants at the World Hula Conference on Maui, uh, Ka'aha Hula o Hala Ola. And the very first Pagan Pride was in 2004 in Hilo, Hawaii. And if I could just read very quickly uh, from the uh, EKF web website, mm -hmm. um, uh, our Kumu writes, Pagan Pride, Ancestral Connections, Chanting the Past into the Future. Oli is the sound that resonates, reverberates, and stimulates the auditory receptors and awakens the inner spirit, connecting the seen to the unseen and eventually to the cosmos, uniting all into one rhythm of the world soul. Oli is the energy emanating from the na'au, which is the gut, to the heart and the many chambers within the umauma, chest, and the po'o, the head reproducing the sounds of the universe. Words are created to paint an image of familiar and esoteric sinew for seeing what the eyes cannot see. And so we were the, um, the third installment of Pagan Pride 3. It was um, uh, invitation only um, uh, mm -hmm. hoike uh, and uniki um, a recital and a graduation initiation and um, and really uh, um, something that's not advertised, something that you can't pay for, mm -hmm. really, really old school. Um, you look for a teacher and the teacher shows up and we were just so lucky to, um, the timing of it, having the, the filming okay. of the Island to Island coincide with, we said, uh, I don't know what you're gonna film because you know we're, we're just embarking on this journey, but things came about. Great. I, I remember explaining early on to both of y'all that I, I didn't know anything about Hawaiian chant about Oli, um, that I did have experience working with Micronesians on an island called Pompeii where the skirt on the wall behind me is from, um, who have oral traditions, some which are shared and some of which are privately kept. These are songs and chants passed down over generations and they might be sung and danced, but maybe only a few people know the detailed meanings of these. Um, so I had no experience with Hawaiian Oli, um, but experience with respecting the boundaries of Pompeian traditions um, and private knowledge in my anthropological work. And I, I do wanna say that it's, it's a really big ask when you ask someone to let you film them. Um, it's asking not only for their time and their energy, but um, putting you in a position where you're representing them and that can be very complicated, particularly with histories of misrepresentation. 
of various indigenous peoples, including Hawaiians by Hollywood and other outsiders. And in my mind, when we set out to make this film, um, initially I talked to Chris and Keone via email and then in person, and then we did ask their kumu the night before the recital um, to get those initial yeses. But when you're making a film with people and trying to be collaborative and share power, these are just ongoing processes, both on camera and behind the camera. Um, and I'm really grateful that Chris and Keone and the other Hawaiian chanters and others chanting in the film and other people who made this film possible took the time and energy. Um, I was very lucky to be working with Chris, who's a filmmaker. Uh, we set up co-editing sessions and we, he spent time going over all the details of the layers with me and Keone, who was working on relationships that are very important to the film. So thank you guys. We were in good hands. <laughs> Yeah, that's fantastic. Penny, did you want to add to anything about the process of making the film? Yeah. Um, so the way that Chris and I met um, was, you know, really serendipitous. Um, you know, I had just come back from New York, I think the night before. I would spent a bit of time there with some family. Um, and on my way home, I think like in the airport, um, I bought a, a Hawaiian seal um, that I found in the airport and, you know, something in, in the back of my head said, you know, buy this Hawaiian royal seal, stitch it to your jeans when you get home um, and just, you know, go about your business. And so it was the next day I was wearing these pants with this with this new patch on it um, and I was getting lunch in uh, Union Square in New York City. Uh, I'd have some headphones in and someone taps me on the shoulder and it's Chris and we've never met before, but he's pointing to this royal seal and he says, you know, are you from Hawaii? Um, I had to take my earphones out, just trying to understand what he was saying. Uh, but that you know, sparked a, a friendship. Um, and I think it was within that first or second conversation, I was talking a bit about you know, some of the radiation that was leaking from, mm -hmm. from Japan at the time with, with the nuclear meltdown um, and how it was affecting the, you know, the ocean at large, but, but absolutely um, you know, Polynesia and the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you know, Kaholawe uh, is an important island within the within Hawaii. Uh, represents Kanaloa, in many ways the ocean. Um, it was a site of a uh, tremendous amount of you know military bombing in the 80s um, that led to an uprising of Hawaiians that, that went and stopped that. Um, and so there was a book that was published um, about Kaholawe and some chants and. With my interest, you know, Chris gifted that to me. Uh, started realizing that this wasn't just a book of pictures and stories; it was a book of chants. And so, as I go deeper into this book, I'm trying to learn some of these chants. I don't have much of a background in, in, in you know, Oli before this. And I asked Chris, um, you know, how do you think we can try and figure out how to say some of these chants? Um, and maybe Chris can finish this part out. Um, well, yeah, and I, I took a glance at uh, the chant in the book, and I noticed the composer was one of my teachers in college. So I happened to have her email and um, just a shot in the dark said, you know, we are looking at this chant you wrote, wondering if you could tell us how to do it. Um, and uh, not expecting a reply because uh, Antipu is a, a private person and, um, you know, she had no reason to reply, but uh, she said, yeah, we can meet. You set it up and we'll have a, a class. So this was pre-pandemic, so um, meeting over Skype and Google Video and things uh, was kind of a novel thing between New York and Hawaii. Um, so it was a great uh, use of technology and a great great adventure. Um, but yeah, it, it goes to show you that uh, it's, a, it's a really New York story as well in that sense that mm -hmm. um, I never met Keone in Hawaii. I met him in New York and um, he happened to have this Hawaiian patch on his jeans. It's like, oh, you don't see that every day. And he, Ilay, um, our mutual friend, Jacqueline, mm -hmm. and I, um, who introduced us, uh, I had never met her in Hawaii. I met her in New York as well. Um, but we shared something in common that he, Ile, and I have both been to the island of Ko'olawe mm -hmm. that uh, Keone had mentioned. So um, it's just interesting. Yeah, the mainland um, Kanaka Maoli Hawaiian experience, Hawaiian connections. Yeah, that's great. So that kind of very nicely sets it up to for my second question, which is a bit of a two-part question. Um, because the film, you know, for those of you who have seen the film, you already know this, but those of you who haven't yet, the film is a fantastic um, exploration of, of the realities of practicing chanting or oli while living in diaspora. And, you know, Chris and Keone, you both have kind of alluded to this. Um, and I guess I was wondering if you might 
think about your own, reflect a bit on your own diasporic experience and what it, what your experience has been um, with the Hawaiian language. Did you grow up speaking Hawaiian language? You know, because Oli is done in Hawaiian. And so just was wondering if you could reflect on that. Um, and then the second part of the question is, you know, the film, as I understand it, was shot in 2015. So I was just wondering if you might reflect a bit on um, how you are still practicing um, and what you're doing now. So for me, you know, I, I grew up, uh, grew up on the continent. Um, my mother is native Hawaiian, both of her parents are native Hawaiian, um, but neither of my grandparents grew up speaking Olelo. Uh, it was my great grandparents that were all fluent in Hawaiian, uh, but they grew up in a difficult time in Hawaii when the language was banned, a lot of the culture went underground. Actually, our, our teacher, Auntie Polani, uh, was one of those families that, that really kept the, the culture alive during that time period. And uh, I lead to this in the film, but my grandma went to a, a school where the language was forbidden. Um, and so that was more or less um, the, the experience I had with Alelo growing up. Um, I grew up with a lot of music, you know, both my grandparents sang a lot, uh, played a lot of music in the house. So that was how I, you know, started my, my um, adventure with the Hawaiian language. Uh, when I was in maybe seventh grade. Um, my great grandmother, who uh, was from the island of Molokai, came and lived with my grandparents um, that had moved to Virginia. My grandfather was in the military, which is why they left initially. Um, and I, I grew up outside the Washington DC area. Um, so we had a unique experience for a number of years with my great grandmother, who was from Hawaiian, uh, very deeply tied to the culture that just shared as much information and passion with me as she could. And that, you know, it sparked um, sparked a fire in me of, of passion. Um, and I wanted to to dig in deeper. Uh, but, you know, being on the, being a diaspora Hawaiian, um, not as easy. Uh, you know, I go and visit my cousins out there. Um, but it, it's just a different experience when you grow up in Hawaii. So, you know, you always feel you have this drum beat and something you, you, you deeply care about inside of you. And it's looking for that outlet to, to grow. Um, and so this opportunity to learn Oli um, you know, over Skype sparked a whole revolution inside myself where I, I felt I was finally connecting to this genealogy that my great grandmother had shared with me. Um, my ancestors started to come alive in my dreams. Um, it, it was a very active period. Uh, you know, the, the chant that we just started with is Pele chant. Um, and you know, speaking to the volcano, speaking to you know such a, a fiery part of of the earth that is so alive. You know, when you see it, um, you can't you know you you can't think anything else. And you know, this is a a living piece of the earth that's speaking to me. It, it is the the heartbeat of the land, um, that lua. Um, and, and so for me, you know, this started a, a journey that's continued to today. Um, you know, that, that period of time uh, and learning those styles of chants uh, just led to more and more curiosity. Um, I, for myself, it's something I do, you know, every morning, every evening, it's a way of meditation. Um, if I ever walk into a forest, especially for the first time, if I'm by the ocean, um, that's when I'm chanting as well. It's a way for me to stay connected with nature, grounded, um, and, and just, you know, that vibration, I think we'll get to it a bit later, uh, has such a healing factor, just the vibration of, of your voice. Uh, it heals yourself and then it's able to reverberate and, and heal the things around you. And so I, I really view it as a medicine um, and something that I, I love to share with my family, love to share with my friends and, and the greater community. Mahalo. Um, yeah. Well, I'll answer this uh, part in part with song. Um, mm. I'm holding my microphone, so I can't grab my ukulele. But uh, being that it's the Mother Tongue Film Festival, Ah, ole au, e au wana ho, ke mau popo, he hava iau, ke mau popo, he 
Hava Eo. So that translates as, um, I now clearly see and understand the home is within my heart. I returned when I realized this. I will not wander again, for I understand I am Hawaiian. So that was written by, um, co-written by Uncle Peter Moon, who passed away. Uh, but he was um, Chinese and Korean, not Hawaiian, but he was actually a central figure in the um, Hawaiian Renaissance movement in the mm -hmm. 70s. Uh, it was part of the musical groups uh, Sunday Manoa, and um, he went on to create his own uh, band, the Peter Moon Band. And uh, my dad was his manager uh, for tours in Japan, and and so I kind of grew up around <laughs> this musical legend. And uh, he wrote that when he moved away from Hawaii and was teaching English in Japan, and he was so homesick. I I, I think this is the story, and he composed this song. And that's when he realized that he he might not be a uh, Koko Hawaii, he might might not have Hawaiian blood, but he is from Hawaii. And that's when he really um, uh, knew who he was. And so um, I grew up in Hawaii. I was born there, but I went to Japanese language school <laughs> in elementary school. You know, I would go to elementary school, and then after school, I have to go to another school uh, for Japanese language. So um, I grew up with that, and then. You know, when I went to Japan myself, uh, visiting family and staying with family friends, um, sh sure, I felt a connection with um, my Japanese ancestry. But at the same time, I felt a little different as well. It's like, oh, I'm not quite from Japan. I'm a little different. And I realized, like, uh, wow, um, Japanese people know so much about their country and they, they're able to teach me things about the culture and and. Uh, various uh, historical places and it's like mm -hmm. I want to be able to do that for them if they come to visit me in Hawaii how ashamed would I be when they come and I can't even you know explain anything so uh, from that I kind of had the sense of gratitude that it's like wow when I get home I'm going to learn more about where I come from Hawaii and the culture and the language which was already around me but um, maybe I didn't quite uh, the, the same appreciation as when I left um, and so now in, I'm living in Brooklyn and it's, um, it's still that connection to home for me, um, the language, and now the chance. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, I mean, we, we started by saying where you're, you're, you're calling in from. Uh, what are you guys doing now? And I guess that's really a question to all of you, really. Um, where what what are you doing and how I think specifically for Chris and Keone, how is Oli being you know how are you continuing doing doing the chanting where you are now? Mm -hmm. um, Hi, Keone. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. So I um, I lived in New York from 2010 up until about a few weeks ago. So I, I'm new to Los Angeles. It's a new journey mm -hmm. for me. Um, in many ways, uh, Hawaii is calling me back. Um, mm -hmm. I started a software company, which is alluded to in the film. I do a bit of background um, in my office there. Um, so, you know, basically ran that company for eight years, ended up uh, selling it to one of our customers. Um, and in many ways, I started that company um, not to build a piece of software, but to connect with my culture and, and find a way to bring the community together in, in New York. Um, you know, my first time, one of my first times after college um, to New York, a few of my grandmother's friends um, met with me, had lunch with me, and just introduced me to this wider uh, Hawaiian community out there. And, and so I felt so much gratitude um, and, you know, was starting something up and wanted to be a place uh, where Oli could be shared, where hula halals could come and practice, where Olelo could be taught, um, and just use a community space as, as sort of, you know, any kind uh, goes down there. Um, and so, you know, when, when um, the life cycle of this company ended, uh, you know, I, I started looking into the future and, and was lucky to connect with an organization uh, called Purple Maya, uh, which is launching uh, an organization called uh, the Malama Venture, uh, or, or uh, Malama Studios, which is a, a venture studio, studio based in Hawaii. So this is an organization that tied really well with, with my background. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, focused on initially 
teaching uh, technology and computer programming to Native Hawaiian children in charter schools, filling a gap in their education to, to give them the skill sets that, might, that they may need later on in life. Um, from there evolved into a uh, incubator where they work with either Native Hawaiian founders or, or companies that have a focus uh, in some way that's rooted in, in Hawaiian culture um, within the startup uh, technology world. Uh, so they basically helped host companies, give them resources to launch those, um, and say, you know, a short story, a, a group like Hohonu that started as working with uh, traditional fish ponds, um, mm -hmm. built sensors that were put into the water to help track which kind of fish were going back and forth, which led to, you know, what's now a leading flood uh, flood prediction software that's being used across the country right now. And so that's a way that, that we view taking um, ancient Hawaiian knowledge and applying it to the modern day uh, mm -hmm. tech, technological workforce. Um, and so, you know, this organization is now launching a, a venture studio where we're building new companies from scratch uh, with a big focus in green energy. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, my partner has at the same time got a job in Los Angeles. So he said, let's move from New York, come out here, uh, allows me to be closer to Hawaii for this project mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, kind of move west and, and, and meet a new community out here. So I'm, I'm on my, my next adventure and it's, it's kind of just starting right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, I think uh, because Keone and I are, are both uh, busy with our lives, um, we're, we're not often in the same city or the same place. I think that's one of the advantages of having more than one kahu oli is that we're <laughs> able to respond and meet the needs of uh, uh, different occasions, depending if, uh, oh, can you cover it? Or, or, you know, oh, I'll get this one. Um, but I do have listed here um, a few times that we were in the same space. Uh, one was for this tribute for our queen, Lilio Kalani. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was at the uh, La Mama Experimental Theater Club. Um, there was a hula troupe from uh, Honolulu mm -hmm. flew out to New York uh, for the occasion. And uh, we were asked to share some chants. So um, you know, that was one occasion where we, we both shared separate chants, but uh, we were in the same space. Um, and then, uh, at the beginning of 2020, um, there was a Hawaiian language theater group that mm. was uh, invited to perform a, a play, and it was all in Hawaiian language, um, O'olelo Hawaii, and uh, uh, some friends of mine as well from um, my time on Ko'olawe with the Protect Ko'olawe Ohana. Um, so they flew out from Hawaii to perform at the uh, Native Theater Festival Mm -hmm. And uh, we were asked if we could uh, receive uh, our our friends um, in a private uh, setting. So we were able to offer some chants together um, in, in that occasion as well. Um, but for myself separately, um, yeah, I'm still in New York and um, home to 600, 800 different languages. Um, and so the, the density of language in, in New York is, is just um, so intense, but it's, it's just fascinating. Um, you know, I'll end up practicing on the sidewalks of New York uh, because often that's how it happens. Uh, you get the venue, you have some time to practice and uh, it's New York City. So, you know, you can be chanting at the top of your lungs and as long as you're not in anyone's way, you know, no one really cares. <laughs> so um, they leave you alone. So. Uh, I'll be chanting in the park, chanting in the sidewalk. Once I was walking and um, I was chanting to myself and the guy walking opposite me kind of gave me a strange look and I looked at his face and uh, we passed each other on the sidewalk and then I recognized the face afterwards. That was Deepak Chopra. So <laughs> I turned around and uh, uh, we had some mutual friends as well, So, um, but I never really spoke to him. So I introduced myself as a oh, uh, Mr. Chopra, I wasn't, you know, just shouting gibberish at you. I was actually practicing a, a Hawaiian chant, and uh, I would love to share the film uh, Island to Island with you. So he gave me his uh, contact and uh, wrote me back later and says, great film. So um, I don't know if I was able to share that story with you, actually, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one of those New York moments. And, um, yeah. you know, people from Hawaii who I've never met before, They'll hear the chanting of Hawaiian chant in New York in New York City. They'll hear me chanting and they'll come up to me and say, "Are you from Hawaii? Is that a Hawaiian chant?" And you know, I've never met them before, but um, 
they grew up with the chant or the sounds of the language and and they recognize it so um wonderful moments like that but but actually three highlights for me that i wanted to share quickly was um uh over the last few years since our um graduation i was able to uh one i was able to bless a beach in new jersey <laughs> i was invited to um uh, a ceremony with the Kiernan Surf Association. Aloha, Uncle Charlie. Um, he has was looking for a kahuna, and uh, somehow mm. they got my email. And um, I said, "Well, I'm not a kahuna, but I am a kahu. Um, and if I was, I was this in this situation, I would do this and this." And it's like, great, you know, can you can you do it? And so I went and blessed the beach in uh, in New Jersey. Um, and then another occasion, I was invited to. Um, share a chant at the Indigenous Peoples Day uh, mm -hmm. gathering. And um, that was incredible because you had just the hundreds of Indigenous people there, um, probably the largest crowd I've ever chanted in front of. Um, and that that was such a treat. And um, just want to acknowledge the passing of our friend, uh, Kevin Tarrant, mm -hmm. uh, who came up to me later and was like, oh, that was you chanting? I was like, wow, you know, I had to put my plate of food down or whatever I was doing and I had to stop and listen to you. Um, so great job. And uh, yeah, he, we lost him to COVID um, last year. So just wanted to acknowledge his passing. Um, and then uh, the third one highlight for me is is uh, being invited to chant at the um, at the Met. So mm -hmm. the, the Museum of um, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, one of the curators there, um, Dr. Maya Nuku, um, had an exhibit. It was called uh, Atea. Um, mm. I think it was Nature and Divinity. And it was a collection of um, artifacts from across Oceania. And um, also Dr. Albert uh, was there as well. But um, there was an opening and a closing of the exhibit because mm. it ran for maybe a year. And so I couldn't make the opening. I guess I was busy with work. Keone actually took the opening and was uh, a part of that ceremony. And then, uh, you know, I put my name in the hat and said, uh, well, I'll jump in at the closing if you need something. And the closing came around and was able to share some chants. And just an amazing experience because, they, you know, we went in before the museum opened mm -hmm. and we were able to just um, be ourselves and share protocol and chants. And in this empty museum, you know, just resounding with all these ancient chants with these ancient artifacts, was uh, was truly an honor. So it was uh, it was a highlight of uh, of my chanting uh, experiences in New York. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, so um, you know, we we mentioned this, but you know, this year, it's of course, theme is the Mother Tongue Film Festival. That is, is the healing power of storytelling, and so I wanted to ask you all to kind of reflect on that. Theme. And so for Chris and Keone, I was just wondering how has healing been part of your learning and teaching of Oli? For me, um, I think it's highlighted really well when the Hokulea arrives in New York mm -hmm. City. Um, so that was a, a Hawaiian voyaging canoe that sailed around the world, uh, going from you know country to country. And what was really important when they landed uh, was that someone locally on behalf of Hokulea and the Pacific Voyaging Society reached out to the indigenous tribes of the region and asked their permission for landing. You know, they had to do the, the official government stuff to get their customs and passports yeah. in place, but it was more important for them to make sure that the indigenous people at that land understood that they were asking permission before they landed. Um, and so for many people, they got very emotional because that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, and that was the whole point of Malama Honua, that, you know, the, the sail around the world, that, that was a healing uh, sail for the, you know, for, for, for the broader world. Um, and, and so, you know, that adventure of, you know, right after graduating uh, with Oli, going to these different uh, tribal territories, asking permission, mm -hmm. uh, seeing their response, sharing culture in a really, um, in a really authentic way. Um, groups like the Shinnecock on Long Island, when we went up to meet with them, you know, they said, you know, Coincidentally, you know, we've lost our our um, navigational skills that were passed down to us, and we're right now trying to get back into the water, and we're trying mm -hmm. to sail, and and we'd love to get that that knowledge from you all, um, and you know that was the same story in Hawaii, you know, when Hokulea was first leaving in the 70s, uh, there was no navigator within the Hawaiian Island chain that, that knew how to navigate and they had to go, uh, you know, and, and find a, a kahu um, in, in Micronesia. 
Um, and, and so, you know, being able to to bring that knowledge from Micronesia to Hawaii all the way to Long Island and, and share that with, with the with the culture, you know, to me that that's the healing and, and that's the power of chant. And you know, starting with asking permission with a chant uh, opens and unlocks so many doors. And and for me that that's been a lot of my journey. Uh, Hokule was one instance, uh, but I've spent time uh, at Standing Rock, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because I got an inv invitation from from the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, uh, that was a big part of helping me get that celebration together in New York. And they were out in North Dakota over the course of you know twelve months after after Hokule arrived, and asked if we could stand mm -hmm. next to them when we were out there. Um, and so being able to go out there to Standing Rock, share chant with those individuals, it just meant so much. You know, bringing a a, a flag from Hawaii and and um, you know, raising it up there, um, just for them, it was solidarity. We've seen how many different cultures and people could come together uh, and, and stand shoulder to shoulder with them um, so they wouldn't feel so isolated. Um, and that fast forwards to, you know, um, I guess it was a, for six weeks in 2019, I, I actually joined our, our, uh, our Kahu, uh, Auntie Pulani, that, that we've uh, discussed so much you know, she was um, proudly arrested in the summer of 2019, uh, standing uh, in protection of Mauna Kea, which is our, our sacred mountaintop um, that is currently, uh, you know, resisting further development uh, on its sacred summit. And for us, as she taught out there, you know, when Hawaiians say something is sacred, it's not necessarily, uh, or, or it, it's sacred because at one point, someone knew this gave life-giving properties, mm -hmm. uh, that there were healing power that came from this place. So that's why we deemed it sacred. Um, and, and for Mauna Kea, you know, it, it's that water source for the island. It, it's the only place in, or it's one of the only places in Hawaii where it snows. It's the only place on Big Island where it snows. And, and that water mm -hmm. feeds the island. Uh, that water makes its way to the ocean that creates oxygen. So that's our water source, our oxygen source. And for someone like her at her age to stand on that front line and get arrested, um, that made that called me to go, you know, get out there as soon as I could. And what she led was, you know, weeks and months of ceremony, sacred ceremony on, on that on that Allah, teaching a lot of the same chants that we learned to, you know, up to seven thousand people in, in a single day. Um, and and to me, that that was healing, uh, bringing people up there and just ex sharing the culture, and again in such an authentic way. Uh, having so many people from places like Standing Rock fly out from all over the world fly out and have that be a, 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 a knowledge transfer. Uh, and, and so much of that is based in chant. And, and that's why I think Jacqueline did such a great job of showing not just Hawaiian chant in our film, but chants from, from all of her other relatives that, that joined us on this journey. Um, and you know that fast forwards me to now, you know, moving to California, Know, knowing that I'm on Tonga land and, and reconnect with a friend that was in a tent next to me uh, on Mauna Kea that said, hey, I live in Santa Barbara, come up and, and visit our sacred lands, come share your chant out here. And to me, that that's just kind of where this where this thread has taken me, you know, following the chant, continuing to share it, you know, standing side by side with others mm -hmm. and, and doing the work and doing the healing work. Um, to me, you know, in, in essence, chanting itself is, is the healing. Um, and it's, you know, directing that as best you can. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, did you want to add to that? Uh, and then I'll... Yeah, if I could um, find my window. Um, well, I was, um, I was actually thinking of, uh, of John Trudell who um, was a Native American uh, activist, poet, um, passed away. But I was able to meet him when I was in college. Mm -hmm. uh, he was performing in Hilo. Uh, and it was just him and a stage and um, an another fellow on the drum, Quiltman was his name. So it was Quiltman and John Trudell sharing a stage. And it was just spoken word. And Quiltman was doing the, uh, the Native American chants at the same time as John Trudell was reading his, his spoken word poetry. And mm -hmm. um, it was such a tremendous uh, memory for me. And uh, I was there with like the public access um, TV station. I was, I was filming it from the back of the theater uh, in downtown Hilo, but I knew uh, I had to get his permission, even though we had permission to film, I had to go and 
ask his permission. So, mm -hmm. so um, after the performance, uh, I went up to the stage and, and found him and I said, Hey, um, I'm here with public access. I was filming in the back. Um, is it okay that we, you know, uh, share this footage? And he looked me in the eye and he was like, you know, use it in the way that it will help the most people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a tremendous moment. And um, I just wanted to read a little bit from one of his poems, which I think will help uh, me to answer this question. Um, just a little bit of his poetry. He says, uh, he writes, Listen to us, impatient one. We are forever. You must remember the gentleness of time. You are struggling to be who you are. You say you want to learn the old ways, struggling to learn when all you must do is remember. Remember the people. Remember the sky and earth. Remember the people have always struggled to live in harmony and peace. And so um, I guess for me, uh, in 2018, I was invited to um, curate a, a series of films for the New York Botanical Garden. And it was for their uh, Georgia O'Keeffe Visions of Hawaii exhibit uh, that summer. And one of the films I selected was a picture from the 50s, I think, Bird of Paradise, mm. um, Delmer Daves. And it was the first time I was seeing the film again with new ears because uh, I was familiar with the film when in college, I, I grew up watching it. Um, but to, to revisit that film after going on this journey of chant with um, Antipua, uh, I was able to appreciate the, the chanting in the movie um, on, a, on a different level than before. Mm -hmm. And so afterwards I was like, who was the chanter in that movie? It was like an uncredited role. Right. And it was actually um, one of Hawaii's last living kahuna Mm -hmm. uh, an actual kahuna, bona fide kahuna, David Ka'onohiokala Bray. And so um, searching the internet, I find he wrote a little manual called The Kahuna Religion of Hawaii and, um, you know, ordered the book. Uh, and, you know, as the Amazon algorithms do, they recommend other titles you might enjoy. And um, there was another book that said uh, Islands of Refuge Adventures uh, with a Living Kahuna. I was like, what's that? You know, because the local boy in me is very skeptical. I was like, is this another person coming in to cash in on our culture? Um, but let me read the book before judging it. So I ordered a copy and uh, just tremendous um, true story of a, a runaway teenager who, who um, befriends a kahuna in Hawaii and he writes down all his uh, experiences uh, living with him. And so um, I reached out to the author and uh, I, I didn't hear anything. But then at the beginning of uh, 2020, he finally replied to me. He was on, he was on Hawaii time. He was on Maui time, I guess. <laughs> but um, we spent the, the whole year of 2020 just, you know, digging into his, um, his experiences with uh, 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 um, a healing man. And so it's, it's outlined in his book. Uh, if you can get a hold of a copy, it's um, The Kahuna Religion of Hawaii. Um, but... Uh, Kahuna Bray talks about healing being like um, uh, a light bulb and you need the positive and the negative currents uh, in mm -hmm. order to have electricity and light. Mm -hmm. And so each of us has uh, um, a light and a shadow, uh, our higher nature, our lower nature. And, and the, the goal is to combine um, living in the material world with uh, some spiritual um, food and nourishment and so um that's that's been a journey for me to to learn about the um the old ways as as what we're lucky to have it uh, documented in in uh, this kahuna's notes so mm -hmm. hope to someday make it to maui and and uh and visit the author in person we've been just meeting over zoom and things so that's great thank you so jacqueline i mean as a filmmaker mm -hmm. and an anthropologist um who studies specific diaspora and now as a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian kind of looking right. at diasporic objects. Yes. Um, I just was wondering if maybe you could think about how the healing power of storytelling, um, how that factored into the filmmaking, right? Right. Whether that was a conscious thing or how you thought about it as you were making the film. Right. So I think um, uh, with the kinds of interactions that Chris was just speaking to, and then the, specifically the ones that Keone was discussing um, just a minute ago, 
there was a moment during the filmmaking process, actually several moments, um, but one of the key ones was at that uh, at the outreach to the Shinnecock um, at their winter formal. And that's not in the film because it isn't an event where uh, I was filming. I was actually there um, chanting um, um, with the uh, with the other members of the Ki Pai Pai uh, protocol um, team and Keone and other chanters were helping me practice in the car. And that's it, it, something to say about filmmaking is it's really important to, when people ask you to put down the camera and participate to do that. Um, but I remember hearing um, the same stories that Keone shared where the Shinnecock were discussing um, reteaching their youth to, uh, to dig out canoes, to use fire and to know when to stop the fire from burning so that it's not gonna go through the lot, but you get the right hollowness onto that canoe and paddling. So when I was looking at the footage from the Hokulea's landing at New York City, um, I saw the really powerful song written by Shanae Bullock, who's Shinnecock uh, on Montauk, I Paddle the Heel. Um, and it was in kind of that moment, thinking back to what I had experienced with the Shinnecock in January um, and with the chanters. Um, and then hearing that song um, that she sang, uh, when I got permission to use that from her um, and to use other Shinnecock songs and to use the images of the Shinnecock paddling around the Hokulea in that final section, um, that was amazing um, because I really did want to layer in the chants from Lenape Hoking from New York City from that area with the visuals of the Hokulea coming um, and create that, um, create that kind of resonance that I had experienced um, filmically. So hopefully that works for everybody when you see the film. Um, it, uh, I worked with uh, Shanae and uh, Weihan Smith who is also Shinnecock, um, to make sure that those songs were cut uh, and shown respectfully um, because I don't speak Hawaiian and I don't speak Shinnecock. Um, and so to get the songs and the chants in there so that, uh, to include as much as possible, but to cut them so that they can fit in a short documentary, um, you have to work with people who understand the meaning of the chant as well as the language um, and who are able to help with uh, to cut properly, um, yeah. So um, I have one more memory about that that's actually not in the film too. Uh, although I'm having a bit of trouble with these, so give me one second. Okay, 20, 20, 20, 21 technology. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so there, there's another, um, in the film, you see a scene um, where you do see um, Chief Reggie Herb Dancer Caesar, who's Matinikok, and Donna Kotu, who's Sack and Fox, um, interacting with uh, the Hawaiian chanters at New York University. Um, so that is in the scene, but there's a moment that I was thinking of when I was editing the film. Um, that's another moment that's not in the film because this is what happens when you're filmmaking. Um, Chris and Keone had a kuleana, a responsibility um, to create verses for this chant that documents the Hokulea's travels since the 1970s. Um, and they were supposed to create the verses that documented its new travels on the Malala Mahonua, the worldwide voyage. Um, and so I actually got to film hours of them working on this uh, with another chanter and Hawaiian language teacher, uh, Kapena Alapai. Um, and they were working out how to talk about the places in North America. Um, 
And I was watching and filming the care with which they were thinking about the indigenous names for different places in North America. And there was a moment where Kapena said they were gonna Hawaiianize the names. Um, and he explained it that this was very, not to rename places, um, but to imagine how it would be if Hawaiians and um, people from Lenape Hoking were meeting with, with Hawaiian being the Hawaiian's first language. Um, so to imagine meeting without that colonial history sort of in between these indigenous groups. Um, and you can see all the names in the subtitles for the chant over the Statue of Liberty. And that's the same chant that closes the film. So when I was editing the film, that didn't end up in the film. Um, but that moment of thinking about how this kind of outreach around the Hokulea and this outreach through chant and Oli and songs, um, it's a way of the past building present and future connections. And I think from my perspective, it seems like there's a lot of power in that ongoing recognition, um, what Chris and Keone were just speaking about, um, power, ongoing recognition between indigenous peoples, and that can work against the histories of non-recognition um, and contemporary non-recognition um, by entities such as the government of the United States. Um, so these kinds of sharing stories alongside sharing chants, I think it, it seems quite powerful as many indigenous peoples maintain their connections to their homelands and build connections as mobile people, including the people that I worked with for my dissertation. Fantastic, thank you. Um, well, I think, I think Could I'll I just acknowledge my, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just, I just wanna acknowledge that um, you know, we're recording this on uh, May the 4th, um, May the 4th be with you, Star Wars Day. But, you know, Star Wars was uh, based on the um, the power of myth with uh, Joseph Campbell. George Lucas, of course, was a, a student of his. Um, and uh, in the power of myth, there's an episode on the first storytellers. And um, at the end of the episode, they, they talk about uh, this book, uh, Black Elk Speaks. And um, and then there's a line in the book where it says, "The center of the, the center of the mountain, the center mountain is everywhere." And um, it's this idea of God is this in, intelligible sphere, whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere, and it thus is a manifest manifestation of that mystery. Um, and so I, I bring this up because as the Hokulea was doing its uh, worldwide voyage, uh, there was a piece of the Our Mountain uh, on board. Isn't that right, mm -hmm. Keone? Mm -hmm. And um, it just goes to show that it's, um, it's, a, it's a symbol of a, of a spiritual principle that uh, I think is, is uh, universal in that sense. Hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. No, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we had talked about um, you all doing a closing chant. Um, do you want to do that first or at the end after I, I do my thank yous? Um, as you wish. All right. Well, maybe I'll take the time to just thank you all. So um, I really want to thank Jacqueline and acknowledge the technical difficulties and glad the baby came back. Um, you know, Chris and Keone for joining us and really sharing your experience and insight. It's it's one of the pleasures of doing the Mother Tongue Film Festival is getting to know mm -hmm. the participants, you know, in all senses of these films. And I just want to acknowledge, you know, how strange a year and a half it's been. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you've been able to weather that in various ways and then take the time to, to, to talk electronically with me and then the audience is really special because it's through doing that that these films really come mm -hmm. even more alive. So I wanna take a moment to thank you. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who's watched and listened and commented. And I also then wanna thank Sarah Rothman, Cecilia Haley and Kate Haas and everyone who helped to make this conversation possible that is behind the digital screens. Um, and I want to encourage people to follow the Recovering Voices page on Facebook to get mm -hmm. notifications about the future events, find out 
uh, about us more on YouTube, as well as visit our website and come back here for our next program, which will be a final panel discussion on the festival's healing power of storytelling. And that will be on Friday, May the 14th. So thank you. And then I'll turn it over to you guys to do closing chant. Can I, can I say a thank you before we chant, guys? Sure. Oh, I, I just wanted to say it's an honor to have uh, Island Island screening alongside the other films at the festival. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, it's the first time that the film's been widely available digitally. So if anybody gets curious about a particular chant, um, you can always rewind to the credits, re rewind to that part. Just, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to uh, thank um, Dr. Albert Rafiti is his last name. I, I couldn't think of it earlier. And then the author of um, Islands of Refuge is Jeff Munoz. Aloha. So um, yeah, we're um, going to offer this uh, closing chant. And it comes from the same cycle of chants, uh, Pele and Hi'iaka, in keeping with the theme of the festival, uh, the healing power of storytelling. Uh, the story of Hawaii is the story of Pele and Hi'iaka. Uh, Pele, you heard at the top of the um, recording, is the goddess of fire. And this closing chant is um, a, a prayer for healing from Pele's sister, Hi'iaka. Uh, and her job is to, to heal the uh, fresh lava flows and... Um, uh, she brings the life back, uh, the regenerative powers of uh, revegetation to a fresh lava field. So um, with that, we would like to offer this to all those who have been uh, affected by the pandemic. Um, this is Mele Pule Ho'ola no Hi'iaka, um, a prayer of healing from Hi'iaka. Kulele uika wana lo la ika nae nae hoe ina lo ya. Hu ya mai la ke ale kamaka ni he a ala he kupa wano hoi kamalu. Eh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-oh-